Most railroads throughout the world are built at standard gauge, where the rails are spaced four feet, eight and a half inches apart. It is easy to build, the loading gauge allows for more space for passengers and freight to be carried, and higher speeds can be achieved with a smoother ride. But track that was this wide didn't always fit wherever it went. Some places had to be reached with tolerances and budgets so tight that the frames of standard rolling stock could snap in half in a corner. So to bring rail service into the nooks and crannies of civilization, the rails were simply moved closer together. This is what's called the narrow gauge. As we are going to find out on this transcontinental journey, each one has a unique personality that suits the purpose they were built for. No two railroads are the same, just like the states they serve. Narrow gauge's advantages were ushered in by those who knew that size didn't matter, especially when establishing rail service just as effectively and as efficiently as their wider brethren. One of these visionaries was George E. Mansfield, an entrepreneur living in Massachusetts in the 1870s. On one of his voyages across the Atlantic, he observed the network of narrow gauge routes in the UK, particularly the Festiniog Railway in Wales. This line was built with a very specific track gauge of 1 foot 11 and 5 eighths inches, at a time when there was no set standards for how wide the trains could be. In Wales alone, there are as many as five different track gauges, all built under the premise that despite their size, they could still carry on with their jobs of moving slate. Mansfield was impressed by their efficiency, and so declared the place for these kinds of trains back home in America. His business plan was settled down in Maine in 1879 with the Sandy River Railroad, which would eventually expand up to 112 miles of track at its peak. The reorganized Sandy River and Rangeley Lakes Railroad would be the largest two-foot gauge railroad in the state, accompanied by a half dozen other similarly spaced lines specifically set in Maine. They would be the narrowest common carriers of their time, operating with every function of the big standard gauge lines for the same purposes and with the same operating procedures. Unlike their standard gauge brethren, they couldn't easily adapt to progress. The automobiles and the Great Depression dealt the finishing blows to this niche market of railroads, with the mighty Sandy River being abandoned in 1935. The last remaining of these lines would go in 1941 and would not resurface in Maine for nearly 50 years. Since the late 1980s, budding groups of railroad enthusiasts have blossomed into bands of volunteers who dedicate their time and effort to resurrect the state's forgotten heritage piece by piece. One such nonprofit group is working to reincarnate the original Wiscasset, Waterville, and Farmington Railway on a section of the original roadbed and with some of the original equipment. Compared to the old Sandy River line, the WWNF was the second largest of the main two-footers at roughly 33 miles of track. So far, the group has relayed two and a half miles worth between Alna and top of the mountain, with plans to extend by another mile northward. The route is currently plied up and down the mountain with 044T Forney number 9, 
the last survivor of four separate main two-footers. She began life in 1891 as Sandy River No. 5, then became No. 6 with the Rangeley Lakes merger, then was sold to the Kennebec Central and renumbered to 4, then was adopted by the WWNF as No. 9, and served the Pike until its downfall in 1933. Instead of the scrapyard, though, No. 9 was taken into refuge by private owner Frank Ramsdale, whose family hid her away in a barn in Connecticut for well over 50 years. Upon her return home in 1995, a thorough restoration was undertaken to bring her back to health, which included a new boiler and a new frame. The finished product isn't necessarily a replica, but it does leave us with an operating steam locomotive, while the original boiler and frames are on display for visitors to examine and learn from. For being so dedicated to preserving the past, few places are just as committed to staying relevant in the future. In addition to new add-ons and new trackage, the WWNF is currently engaged in a fundraising effort to build a new boiler for sibling number 10, and for building a brand new locomotive from scratch, number 11. The so-called Campaign 21 has so far risen over $100,000 to building new boilers for each of these engines, in addition to growing enthusiasm and encouraging more people to become members to join the fun. In the face of adversity that most historic organizations face, railroading is one of the few industries where enthusiasm fuels itself. The main two-footers may have been the narrowest common carriers of their time, and their comparatively short lifespans would leave some qualities to be desired, yet the appeal for these little trains is unmatched today, as the seemingly toy-like charm rubs off on the preservation industry. At the end of the day, though, these are not toys. Most narrow-gauge pikes were comfortable with the rail spaced three feet apart, allowing for more space to carry passengers and freight. Yet there was no actual set standard for how narrow the rails could be, as there were a dozen different variations of width. These lines were secluded to the region they served, so interchangeability was not essential as long as they delivered the goods to the customer. Moving freight and passengers is the whole point of having a railroad, after all. There are very few places, though, where the different gauges of track interchange with one another, especially at places where the destination is to nowhere in particular. One of these dwellings got its start in northwestern Indiana, where some local steam buffs got together to show off their restored farm equipment. This parcel of land would become home to a sawmill, an electric plant, stationary steamers, and not one, but three loops of railroad track, each at different widths. Since 1969, the trains of the Heston Steam Museum have been taking guests on a leisurely ride through 155 acres of hills and forests. The narrow-gauge equipment comes from various walks of life. Sawmills, factories, switching yards, amusement parks, and zoos. This 040 tank engine, for example, was built in Czechoslovakia in 1940, with the two passenger cars for the Brookfield Zoo near Chicago. Coupled together, though, the consist makes for a very nice ride. Both operate on two-foot gauge track, with the outside rail being able to accommodate three-foot gauge locomotives and cars, which also operate at various times throughout the year. This is what's known as dual gauge. Operating alongside the so-called slim gauge are even slimmer gauges, 
Also encircling the campus is a 14-inch gauge loop of track for miniature trains. This 5-inch scale 464 Hudson was built to carry guests around an amusement park. And then there is the even smaller half-inch scale pike, where the rails are spaced seven and a half inches apart, and the passengers are just barely able to fit on board. They may look even more toy-like than the main two-footers, but they still have the look and function of the real thing. The Heston Steam Museum is fulfilling a vital role in preserving the essence of steam power, with and without rails. Size is never an issue when it comes to educating and engaging people in this technology, but having the little trains operating as common carriers in flat land like this may seem more like an economical oddity. At one time, there were dozens of narrow-gauge pikes across the Midwestern states, but as the transportation industry became standardized with the passage of time, it was not uncommon for these little pikes to be absorbed by standard gauge systems, some of which still uses the right-of-ways they cleared by simply widening the gauge a little. Here in the Great Plains, narrow-gauge railroading was very much a niche market, and one that became superseded rather swiftly by its competition. Here in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, though, the lore of the narrow-gauge takes on a life of its own. In 1872, Governor John Evans chartered one of the territory's most prolific rail lines, in a bid to penetrate the territory's mineral belt deep in the Rockies. The Denver, South Park, and Pacific would span the state by 335 miles, the most narrow-gauge track in all of Colorado. Its existence was spurred by a mining boom in the town of Leadville, with more potential found in Gunnison, and so were both accessed via two paths across the Continental Divide. Such a grandiose venture would be supported financially, first by the Union Pacific, and later the Burlington Route, on a network that would last in its slim-gauge form until the late 1930s. Remnants of the South Park are scattered along the old route. Most of it has been reclaimed by nature, but some select spots are meticulously being nursed back to health. The most visible sign of progress is in the town of Como, which is still home to the original depot, railroad hotel, and its 1882 vintage stone roundhouse. In 2017, they were joined by a newcomer. With help from the relatively new South Park Rail Society, the roundhouse now houses an active steam locomotive. This is Klondike Kate, a diminutive 262 Prairie type. Having served diligently in the Yukon Territory from 1912 to 1952, she moved down south between tourist railroads over the years before finally settling down here in operation. She is now headlining a new charge to breathe new life back into this old railroad town, with plans to relay track on the original roadbed. It's a very unique endeavor, but is one that is not unheard of. There were once dozens of slim gauge lines that looped and switched back their way through the canyons and mountains, operating with varying degrees of success. While most standard gauge lines could only watch from afar at the profits being reaped or to laugh at their follies, few went as far as staking their claims with their own narrow pads. The Colorado and Southern was one of two which held its own network, running due west into Clear Creek Canyon to Leadville and Silverplume. In addition to the tight curves and steep grades, the most effective way for the railroad to gain altitude was to loop the track over itself, 
When the Georgetown Loop opened in 1884, it became a public curiosity that inspired tourists to come from far and wide to watch the trains pass over themselves. The steel bridge stood until 1940, when the line was abandoned and the bridge was dismantled for scrap. So in 1984, one million dollars was raised and the bridge was put back. This exact replica of the bridge is still in use by the Georgetown Loop Railroad, which operates the remaining three miles worth of the original route from Silver Plume. Much like the original line, the loop is a 95-foot tall draw for sightseers, which at its peak is still traversed by rail six times a day, seven days a week. Steam and diesel are both in operation here, with 280 Consolidation number 111 hailing from Central America, and plenty capable of handling the climb through the Clear Creek Canyon. This is one of the few places where the locomotive stack talk speaks for itself. Only one other standard gauge railroad had staked their claims in these mountains. They didn't have the most miles of track, nor did they have the same engineering wonders, but one could easily make the argument that they were the most dedicated. The Denver and Rio Grande began life as a narrow gauge pike and came to maintain a complete circular route around the Rocky Mountains that interchanged with a standard gauge network. At its peak, it branched as far south as Santa Fe, New Mexico, and dug deep into the veins of valuable minerals in the San Juan Mountains, and virtually every other mountain range in between. The most daunting of these lines formed the lower spine of the entire network, known as the San Juan Extension. It ran with dual-gauge track south from Alamosa, branched away from the standard gauge at Antonito, and would cross the border between Colorado and New Mexico 11 times in order to get the best possible route through the mountains. The path they took would also creep along the ledges of the Toltec Gorge and crest Cumbres Pass at 10,015 feet above sea level. When completed in August of 1881, the extension snaked for nearly 200 miles to the self-established railroad town of Durango. From here, feeder lines branched out to the farms at Farmington, New Mexico, to forests around Pagosa Springs, and most prominently of all, 
to the silver mines around Silverton. It would only take the railroad nine months to reach the booming metropolis in the midst of a mining boom, and would be the pride of purpose for the narrow gauge network. At its peak, over 40 mines and three short line routes sent the flowing mass of silver down the branch to the smelters at Durango, which would refine the metal into currencies which the San Juan Extension would carry back to the standard gauge network for distribution throughout the country. For a route built quickly and on the cheap to get as much money out of the region as they could, it was built surprisingly with standard gauge measurements. While there were actual propositions to widen the gauge if business picked up, it was actually a stealth tactic for the Rio Grande to keep competing railroads from building in and encroaching on their business. By narrowing the gauge, the Rio Grande would establish the premise that the region could be sufficiently served by rail, but not worth going through the expense to build their route and exploit a monopoly that could wither up in a few short years. Following World War II, it was becoming clear that the railroad's real competition was the car. As the roads improved, cars and trucks could travel at less cost and much faster with greater convenience, making the narrow gauge very antiquated. Gradually, the unprofitable segments of its network were torn up. The whole network would have been gone within 20 years had it not been for two important factors. In the early 50s, Hollywood discovered the photogenic magic of the San Juan Mountains and filmed many western-themed movies around railroad towns like Durango. Movies like Ticket to Tomahawk, filmed on the Rio Grande Silverton branch, helped to reinstate the majesty of these mountains and inspired film audiences from all over the world to come, via highway, to see them for themselves. The Rio Grande began operating special excursions for these tourists, who made the 45-mile route into a worldwide phenomenon. The legacy is kept up by the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad, which operates as many as three trains a day over some of the most rugged parts of the mountains. To this day, the train is still the best and only way to see the full splendor of the San Juan Mountains. The rest of the Rio Grande's network didn't seem to have the same historic and scenic charm as the Silverton branch, which led to the San Juan Extension's inevitable filing for abandonment. That too was thwarted by a different kind of boom. With fresh reserves of crude oil discovered in the Four Corners region, there was only one way for the oil companies to state their claims. For 10 years, the San Juan Extension was pulsing with activity 24-7 all year round transporting pipe sections and assorted supplies to the end of track at Farmington, New Mexico. When the work was done, so was the railroad, which operated its last revenue freight train in August of 1968. This would also be the last ever steam-powered freight train on a Class 1 railroad in the entire country. A short time later, a case had been made between the states of Colorado and New Mexico where the railroad crossed the border 11 times. A commission was set up to take ownership of the most scenic 64 miles of track between Chama, New Mexico and Antonito, Colorado, which would be the longest and highest tourist railroad in the country. The highlights of today's Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad includes cresting the highest active railroad summit at 10,015 feet and the narrow ledge along the Toltec Gorge. Every other mile in between is threaded with some of the most varied scenery in the southwest, between rolling prairies in the east and pine-laden forested mountains in the west. 
As for motive power, both Cumbres and Durango depend on the K-36 and K-28 classes of 282 Mikados, which have been plying these very rails for well over 90 years. <laughs> Fifty years after their builders abandoned them, both segments of the Rio Grande's narrow-gauge empire are living at standards they could not have envisioned. For a track gauge that helped close frontiers, some of the paths they left behind are some of America's most overlooked treasures. <laughs> To make standard gauge viable here would have been impossible. Whether it was by topography or economics, none of these routes would have accommodated for a wider track gauge. This track gauge may not be as economically practical as its standard gauge brethren, but the legacy left behind by all of these pikes leaves its followers wanting for more. They haven't become obsolete, as many of them have found a new purpose in an ever-changing world that retains its fondness for the good old days. It is by the dedication of volunteers, historians, entrepreneurs, and their customers that ensure the little train's viability for decades to come. As far as reconnecting the present with its past goes, its advantages can best be seen within the deep crevices of civilization, often the last place to look. To access some of the most overlooked wonders of the world, both natural and man-made, the only way to get there is on the narrow gauge.